Welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. We're glad that you're joining with us this morning, and we are pleased to have Pastor Tom back with us this morning to bring the word for all of us. I'm excited to hear the word that's God, that God has put on his heart for this morning. Uh, Cam and the team will be leading us in a few moments, and as you know, we value the uh, creative expression in our church through the arts, and the team this morning has prepared a gospel influence set that's sure to be exciting. I was excited to be a part of it, and I look forward to worshiping along with all of you as we sing some of these old songs together this morning. I just want to remind you, there is going to be communion this morning. I'll be back to lead us all in that. So stay tuned after Tom's message for communion. And then don't forget that this Wednesday, May the 5th, is our AGM. If you're looking to get involved with that or to participate with that, uh, information is in our weekly church email as well as in our church Facebook group. It's going to be held via Zoom, so the link's to get uh, connected as well as the times and all the information are available in those locations. We hope to see you there and get a chance to connect once again. Are you ready? Church starts now. Free from the burden of sin There's power in the blood Power in the blood Would you or evil a victory win There's wonderful power in the blood There is power, power Wonder-working power in the blood Free from your passion and pride There's power in the blood Power in the blood Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide There's wonderful power in the blood There is power, power Wonder-working power in the blood service for Jesus your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. The 
double cure Save from wrath And make me pure Nothing in My hands I bring Simply to like cross I cling Naked come to thee for dress Helpless look to thee for grace Foul light to the fountain fly. Wash me, say you're I die. Fleeting breath When mine eyes Shall close in death When I rise To worlds unknown See thee on Thy judgment of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let me hide myself in thee Leaning, leaning, 
safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. watching this, whether it's in the morning or the evening, but I want to just give a shout out to my good friend Dave Veach. He set me up perfectly with his transition uh, sermon from last week, and he talked about Paul the Apostle. Well, today I want to share with you about something that's been brewing for a long time, and the question is that everyone needs a Barnabas. Let's pray. Lord, as we come into the Word today, we are grateful that these people are examples of of what you desire of qualities to be worked out in our lives. Everybody needs a Barnabas. I need a Barnabas. And I believe every single person is watching this needs a Barnabas too. I pray that you'd help me to deliver this clearly so we know what that means. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think in terms of concepts. And for me, one of the concepts that I believe to be true is that trust is transferable. So what does that look like? It looks like this, that if someone that I trust trusts another person, even though I have not met that person, there is uh, an instant rapport. I am building on the trust of someone that I trust that trusts this person. They start with a high level of trust because trust is transferable. Now, in regards to the topic, everybody needs a Barnabas, we're going to talk about who Barnabas is. He's one of those people who you may or may not have heard about, but he played a very important role in the development of the New Testament church because he demonstrated this concept that trust is transferable. 
I'm going to say that if there had not been a Barnabas, there would not have been Paul the Apostle. Now, of course, we know there's the sovereignty of God, but God uses people. And in an age where trust is very shaken, where people say, can I trust this person? Can I trust that? Can I trust this news source? Is it reputable? Is it reliable? For me, the very strongest expression of trust is from one person to another, not through some media source, but one person saying, I trust this person, and because I have a relationship, you can trust them too. We saw that last week with Dave, whom I trust with my life. I was able to say, hey, Dave started with a particular level of trust for those of you who had never seen or met him, saying, if he is a friend of Tom's and Tom trusts him, then I'm going to start with a position of trust. I want to start just by having a few um, words here. First of all, that Barnabas was a man of good reputation. Uh, He was a leader within the church at Antioch, and Antioch was in Syria on the Orontes River. And and every Gentile church, i.e. churches that are not uh, Jewish, uh, we are all daughter churches of the church at Antioch. It was a very influential place. It is not a a surprise then that Barnabas was a leader of this dynamic local church that touched the world, and it is not a coincidence that in the sovereignty of God, that God planted Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, in this church of influence to reach the world. He was a special envoy. We're going to see through the scriptures and through the book of Acts. We're going to see that that the church, they so trusted Barnabas that when they needed somebody to go and sort something out or someone to report accurately what was going on, they sent Barnabas. So Barnabas was a person who was trustworthy. And because he was trustworthy, when he went to bat for someone, the people said, we trust Barnabas. And if Barnabas trusts Saul, then we're going to take that risk. I want to just uh, take time to, to read, though I have my notes here in front of me. I want you to know that I, I still have a Bible. And it's interesting. Here's what it says. It says about, about uh, what we talk about when it comes to Barnabas. It says, Joseph, in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, uh, it said he sold a field and he brought the money, put it at the apostles' feet. What I like about this is that we know this guy by his nickname. His real name was Joseph, just like one of my pet peeves is, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are their names of captivity, not Azariah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know that they they have these, these real Hebrew names. Well, it, Joseph's name uh, was became uh, Barnabas, which is son of encouragement. And it was a name that was given to him by the apostles. Again, people of trust. The apostles were people of trust. They saw this quality and this characteristic of encouragement, and they gave Joseph, of the, the Levite from Cyprus, they gave him this nickname, and that nickname stuck. Now, I'll tell you a little quick story. Once upon a time in, in, in a world far, far away, um, I was a leader of a boys' club in the Kingsway Church. And uh, we had this thing about giving people nicknames. In fact, uh, Danny Hunt, who's here, uh, he's running the camera. Uh, it was interesting when we went on a mission trip that he was affectionately given the, the nickname Billy because his real first name is William. You can get that on a trivia test. And so somebody started calling him Billy, and that was his nickname. Well, the reality is that, that Joseph comes down to us through the rest of the book of Acts as Barnabas. He was given the name Son of Encouragement. He did not give himself that name. He wasn't bragging, but what happened was that he was such a person of influence because he was a man of of encouragement that they said, oh, there comes Barnabas. There comes Barnabas, and the name stuck. Now, my question to you is, do you know people that when they enter a room, they just light that room up? that they just lift people up. They're just such encouragers. So the question is, are you a ray of sunshine when you walk into a room or when you're dealing in a leadership capacity? And remember, I believe we're all leaders, even if we're leaders of one. Or are you a dark cloud? 
It's a question that you should be not only asking yourself, but other people. How do you show up? How do I show up? So we see then that he was a son of encouragement, and we see that he lifted people up. Now, I want to just have a really quick summary of Saul of Tarsus that Dave set me up so well last week. Saul of Tarsus, that he was not a bad person. He was, he was um, again, he was uh, very devoted to, the, to, to the, the teachings of God, that he was passionate, he was schooled at the, at the feet of Gamaliel, and, and it, it, he was passionate. He did not want to see this upstart sect called Christians or the followers of the way, he did not want to see uh, there to be any dilution of what he believed was the true word of God. And so what happens is we see that he was, was striking out and he was persecuting the church, not because he was a bad person, but he had a misguided passion. And uh, we, we read, we were first introduced to him in Acts chapter 8. Again, Dave set me up on this, that it says that, that when they were stoning Stephen, the first martyr, because Stephen was giving such a strong witness of the way that, that they felt that he was blaspheming and they picked up stones and they were stoning him, it says that they laid their coats at the feet of Saul. Now, I did some research on that. That was not just that Saul was in agreement, but he was actually a principal witness or a prosecutor. And so by him doing that, he was in full agreement. And again, he wasn't about murders and all of those things, but he was so passionate. He said he was zealous about the law. It was misguided. We have to be careful. That's a whole other sermon. Then we see in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, and this is the King James. I, I love it. It says, and Saul was breathing, uh, it says, threats and invectives. Like, you know, instead of like uh, it's just murderous threats, but threats and invectives. And he was doing this, uh, and he was persecuting. It says that he got the okay to, to uh, throw them in jail and to prison. And in fact, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was in fact on a mission by the high priests in Jerusalem to persecute those whom they felt were straying from the truth. Now, it's interesting, Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle. And if you read through, we, we see that 13 of the 27 books of the, of the New Testament were written uh, by Paul through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we read that he, he talks about his former life, and he, he does with great remorse, and, and uh, how you know, he, he realized that, that he was misguided, and he talks about the fact that Jesus died to save sinners, of whom I am foremost, that, that Paul had a genuine experience with Jesus Christ. Now, in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 to 30, and I'll let you read that for, your, for yourself, basically what happened was that, that Saul, in, in chapter 9, he has this, quote, Damascus Road experience where he's on his way to persecute the church. Jesus appears to him. He falls down, and, and he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and Jesus said, um, he says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And the Bible says that there were scales, that he was blind, and everybody else just heard this noise. But here was, was Saul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He was forever changed. Aren't you glad that Jesus is still in the life-changing business? Have you had a Damascus Road experience? Maybe you're a seeker, and you're, you've, you've tuned into this YouTube rendition of our service, I want you to know something. If the Bible says, if you seek him, he will be found of you. Be open to a Damascus Road experience. Well, what happens is, is that Saul, he's blind. They lead him in, and there is this follower of Jesus by the name of Ananias, and, and Jesus appears to Ananias in a dream and says, I want you to go, and I want you to pray for Saul of Tarsus because he is praying even now. And Ananias says, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He's the same guy that's dragging people, you know, in, into court. He's the same one who's persecuting people. Are you kidding me? And God says, he is my chosen vessel. So Ananias, because he trusted Jesus and he trusted his ability to hear God, and hear the Lord's voice, he went and he prayed, and the Bible says that the scales fell off of Saul's eyes, and he was baptized, and it says he went about preaching powerfully from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. 
So then we run the tape forward. So Saul wants to join with the disciples and they are suspicious. Like, is he really, truly a changed man? Is this just an act? Is this a ruse? Is he trying to be a a double agent? Is he trying to be a spy? Is he going to cart us all away? And so they did not believe that he was genuine. Well, in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 to 30, we see, guess who shows up? Barnabas shows up. And it says that Barnabas took Saul and brought him to the apostles. Now, remember, Paul says he was a good man. He was a good of a man of good reputation, that he was not going to sully his reputation. But I'm sure that he questioned Saul. I'm sure that he vetted Saul and said, Saul, tell me again about your your um, experience on that Damascus road. What what happened? What changed? And so Barnabas, not only was he a son of encouragement, but he was also a person of discernment. And so what we see is that 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 uh, Barnabas, that he says, yes, this guy is legit. This guy is for real. And because the apostles trusted Barnabas, they extended to Saul the opportunity says, come and join us. He vouched for Saul and he shared Saul's miraculous experience and how he preached fearlessly in the city of Damascus. Now, it's interesting, he says that Saul stayed with them and that he preached boldly in the name of the Lord. It says that he talked and he debated with the Grecian Jews, i.e. Gentiles. Uh, Well, excuse me, the Grecian Jews were those who were not within Jerusalem and they were a little more liberal, but that was just kind of a precursor because Paul would be the apostle to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish population. And it says that he was reasoning with them even though he was formerly a persecutor. And it says that the disciples saved Paul, Saul, from being killed. Like they let him down in a basket, you know, because they were those that were so afraid of Paul because he was such a powerful person that they were they were uh, worried about it. And the disciples risked their own lives. So we see then that trust was transferable. Now, in Acts chapter 11, verses 22 to 24, we see that there was an outpouring of the gospel amongst the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people in the world. And they, it says that they, it was evidenced by great grace. I love that. Uh, it says, and great grace was upon them. And you see that throughout the book of Acts. And it says, and the church sent, guess who? Barnabas. Barnabas, we trust you. You go and you figure out what's going on. And we want you to know, are these people truly and and completely transformed by the power of Jesus Christ? We trust you. So the Bible says that Barnabas went. And so what happens is he saw in Antioch, uh, in Acts eleven twenty three 23, says, when he arrived, Barnabas, he saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad. And listen to this. He encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. I love this. That Barnabas didn't come and he wasn't like checking all the boxes. He wasn't saying, what about this? What about this? But what happened was he had an open heart and he had an open spirit and he saw the grace of God on these people's lives. And it says that he encouraged them. Again, son of encouragement. Are you an encourager? Am I? And it says to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. And verse 24 says, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Now, I digress here for a moment. Nothing upsets me more than currently what's going on in the, in the greater world. It saddens me that the Church of Jesus Christ all too often, especially in the media, are seen as narrow-minded, judgmental, And unfortunately, in many ways, conspiracy kooks. And yes, I don't make any apologies about that. Instead of really encouraging people to remain resolute and true to Jesus Christ, we have allowed the dialogue to sweep us up in things. Well, what about this? And what about this? What about this? I want to encourage us to be like Barnabas. Let's look for the good. Let's look for what's happening. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about how Jesus transforms lives. Let's talk about how people can come to faith whose lives have been broken. That's what Barnabas did. I want to be like that. I want to encourage you to be like that.
Then we see what happens is that it says that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, this, this, this dynamic local church in Antioch in Syria on the Orontes River, that it touched the world. Oh, Jesus, let that be true of every local church, that we are like the church in Antioch. Then we read in Acts uh, chapters 13 and 14, we see Barnabas and Paul, the dynamic duo. We see that they go, and wherever they go, there's healings, there's miracles, and, and people wanted to be around them, that they were going out, and they were once again not sharing controversy, not sharing debate, not sharing judgment, but they were sharing the good news that Jesus was alive, that he was the Son of God, he was the Messiah, that he came to die for the sins of the whole world, he rose from the dead to prove that he was God, and that he still lives to transform lives. That's why they were dynamic, not because they were judging, they were sharing the good news of the gospel. You've heard me talk about this. It says that if it ain't the good news, it ain't the gospel. Then we see that if you read through that, there was a shift in the scriptures. It was Barnabas and Paul, and it shifted from Paul to Barnabas. We also see this where it talked about, about uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, you know, that is, it used to be Aquila and Priscilla. And then we see that later on that Priscilla's name was mentioned first. Usually commentators say, and I would agree with this, that meant that, that was the person who had the most influence. So it went from Barnabas to Paul. And so Barnabas didn't get his nose out of joint and say, well, I'm the one who found you. I'm the one who discovered you. But what we see is that Barnabas, he really understood discipleship. And so when we start pouring our lives into, into other people, let's be sons and daughters of encouragement. And if there is somebody that's, that we touch, someone that we build into, that they have a greater impact, we need to adopt a John the Baptist role. In John 3.30, it said when people started to follow Jesus, hit, John's disciples came to him and said, oh, everybody's following Jesus. And John said, he must increase and I must decrease. My dad used to always say a lot more would be done for the kingdom of God if we weren't so concerned about who was going to get the credit. Now, in Acts chapter 15, we, we see that the plot thickens. So here's Paul and Barnabas, and they're going, and they're reaching people. But it's interesting that Paul, as the principal, that he and Barnabas, they have a falling out, and they have a falling out over the very calling that, that both of them would have. So Paul, he was all about get the job done. We need to be people who are 100% sold out. And you can read that in the scriptures. Well, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, he had this cousin by the name of John Mark. And if you read through the Acts account, John Mark was not yet developed in his personality and in his walk with the Lord. And in my vocabulary from the 70s, he was flaky. And so basically what happens is, is that but Barnabas says, hey, Paul, we got to bring John Mark with us. I see something in this young man. We can work with him. Yes, he can be a little bit of a flake. And yes, he can jam out. But I really believe, I believe in him. And, and Paul says, no, he jammed out. And I need people on the team that I can count on. You know, that was, again, a strength of Paul's, but it was a weakness. So what we see here is, is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, that, that Paul changed his tune. And that shows me that we do not have to be prisoners of our past mistakes or our inflexibility. So 2 Timothy was the last epistle, the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote that made it into the canon of Scripture. And what we see here, if Paul is wrapping up his, his last will and testament, and he's encouraging young Timothy. He somehow must have learned or got some of that, we used to call it, some of that anointing transferred to him that we see that Paul, after this falling out and where there was such a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, over the support of a young developing leader, Paul began to pour himself into imperfect people. There was Timothy, there was Titus, there was other people that he poured his life into. He learned a lesson. And so in this very last epistle, he wrote this. It says, and bring and get Mark and bring him along with you because he has become useful to me in my ministry. Whoa, what an awesome statement. 
bring him with me. So here was a guy who was willing to break up the dynamic duo and say, look, if you're going to go with Mark, that's fine. I'm going to find somebody else. And he found Silas. And so, you know, in the eternal scheme of things, there was Paul and Silas. You know, remember, you can read about them in Acts chapter 16 in the prison there in Philippi. And then Barnabas was just quietly going about reaching in and building into people. And so Paul I think he, he makes a statement, I was wrong, I gave up too soon on John Mark. I gave up too soon. Bring him with you, bring him, go get him, bring him with me, for he has become useful. Here's the deal. My experience now in 40 plus years of vocational ministry, that the reality is this, is that leaders had had somebody who was building into their life and someone who was developing them. I never forgot my dad said, son, don't forget whose shoulders you are standing on. Now, I read a book early on in my ministry by Joyce Landorf. It was called Balcony People. And we all need people in our lives that are in the balcony cheering us on. We are on the stage and we need people who are up and there's bravo, bravo, bravo. Go for it. Be your best. You can do it. That's the kind of people we need. We need people who are willing to invest. We need people who are willing to take risks in people. And so this is really germane to what's going on in our church right now. As you know, this December 31st, that I will be uh, passing the baton of the lead pastorship that I have willingly and lovingly embraced for since 1982. And of course, you know, Lottie and I, we poured our life into this place. And we are passing the baton. And I want to be a balcony person. Danny, Pastor Danny's going to do things differently. Pastor Danny's going to make changes because the world is changing. And the last thing anybody uh, that's in his position needs is a Debbie Downer or a, a, a Derek Downer. We need people who are saying, go for it. Take risks. Make changes. We're behind you. We're going to pray for you. Are they going to make mistakes? Of course they did. Chance, you, if you've been around for any length of time, you know, those of you who've been with me for any length of time, you know, we try things. Some things worked, some things didn't. We did our best, but there will be mistakes. We need to be people who are Barnabases, whether we're male or female. We need to be people who are sons and daughters of encouragement, that we are rooting people on, that we're in the balcony, we're clapping, we're whistling and saying, you can do it. Keep running, keep trying, pick yourself up. You're not out of the race yet. I'm very passionate about this, as you can see. Then what we see is that in conclusion, I want to just wrap this up. So I want to ask you, who is or was a Barnabas for you? Who was a Barnabas or who is a Barnabas for you? Have you thanked them? Have you thanked God for them in your life? I am very grateful. And encouragement doesn't always mean, hey, you did a great job, but encouragement sometimes looks like correction. Hey, you know, because I believe in you, I just don't want to see you go down that path. I don't want to see you make the same mistakes that I did. And you know what? I'm not sure you handled that in the right way. I want to encourage you to make that right. I want to encourage you to acknowledge that you that you 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 didn't represent yourself or the Lord well in that, but you can do this. Who is a Barnabas for you? Have you thanked them? Have you thanked God for them? I am so grateful for people who have built into my life. And I, you've heard me talk about this. I have been greatly blessed my whole life by being around amazing men and women of God from the time I was old enough to understand sitting in the living room and listening to missionaries and great giants of faith talk about miracles and seeing the dead raised and seeing broken bones healed and 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 seeing outpourings of the holy spirit and i can name some of them you hear me talk about jerry cook i think about 
Don McGregor and how he talked about how in the Philippines, and there's a book called New Testament Fire in the Philippines, how they were praying in a convention and the, the doors blew open and the Spirit of the Lord fell and how that, that country was forever changed. And, and I've had the privilege of sitting and listening to Don. I've had the privilege of, of others, you know, my father and my pastor, Barry McGaffin, people who believed in me. Who is your Barnabas? You need to remember and you need to re re recall the lessons that they learned and you need to, to say, follow their example as they follow the Lord. And the next and last question is, are you a Barnabas? Are you a Barnabas? Are you critical? Am I? Am I looking for fault finding and saying, well, he didn't do this or she didn't do that or, you know, she jammed out or, you know, she made a big mistake? You know, my experience is that people, most of the time, they know they've made a mistake. And I, I've said, I don't think you really need to tell people they're sinners. I think people know that they're sinners deep down. I think they need a Barnabas to come along and says, you can be changed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can take your sins and your failures, and he can change your life. He can make you into his image, and he can continue to walk with you. Are you a Barnabas? Are you? When you come into the room, do people duck and cover? Or do they want to be with you? I know people like that. I just want to be with people who are Barnabases because it makes me want to be more like them as they are more like Jesus. The question is, are you a Barnabas? And to whom will you be Barnabas? I close with this. You know, I often quote Uncle Jerry, Jerry Cook. He wasn't a biological uncle, but he was an uncle to him, so many of us. And I remember asking Jerry, said, Jerry, why did you invest in some punk kid like, you know, me in my early 20s? And, and uh, he looked at me and he said, well, you know, Tom, he said, I pay attention to people that I keep running into. And I just kept running into you. And, and my scheme is things, I say, okay, Lord, if I just keep running into somebody, is that somebody that you want me to come alongside and encourage? And I'm very grateful that he did that for me. And I want you to know with, with all of the strength that I have and with the time that I have left for, for me, I hope it's a long time, but as we found out with Lottie, her home going quicker than we expected, I want you to know that I dedicate myself to being a Barnabas and to looking for people that I can encourage and egg on to be all that Jesus wants them to be. Let's pray. So Father, I pray that you would help us. I pray that this would be an encouraging message. It would not be a, a, a discouraging message. It's certainly not fault finding. But Lord, I pray that Lord, that we would remember, says oh, everybody needs a Barnabas. Help us to be Barnabases to the people that we come in contact, those that are close to us and those that are casual contacts, that we can help them to see Jesus in us. I ask this in Jesus' name. And again, Lord, I pray that if there's anybody that's investigating faith, that's watching this, Lord, I want to be a Barnabas today that your sins can be forgiven, that your failures can, can, be, can be changed into victories as you submit yourself to the Lord, that, Lord, we thank you that you are the ultimate encourager, that you want to encourage us to be more like you, that you died so that we didn't have to. You paid the price of our sin that we, like the Apostle Paul, can say, Jesus, you died to save sinners of whom I am chief. But we thank you that you reached down to elevate us to become sons and daughters. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Love you lots. Hello, church. Thanks again for joining with us this morning. If you have not yet had a chance to grab the elements that you need for communion, I want to encourage you to take a moment, pause the video. I won't go anywhere. Uh, grab what you need for communion and then meet me back here and we're going to participate together this morning. Now, as we um, come to the communion table today, uh, something that Pastor Dave sp said last Sunday in his message has really resonated with me in this, in this past week. He said that grace comes before peace. You know, I've been thinking about that all week long. I think it was a really profound insight. As we come to the communion table, I was thinking about that, that grace comes before peace peace. And really one of the things that we remember, one of the things that we celebrate at communion is the grace of Jesus, the grace that covers over all that we've done, all of our sins, all that our wrongdoing, the grace that he extends to us so that we can come into right relationship with him. So this morning as we uh, break the bread and, and drink of the cup, 
let's re, uh, you know, once again accept the grace that God has for us. Let's accept the grace that he extends to us. And as we do that, let's invite and welcome the peace of God that gets flood into our hearts, into our minds, into our spirits, recognizing that grace comes before peace. And as we once again reflect on and accept his grace, that the promise is here today at this table, his peace will also flow into our lives. So as the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance as of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So wherever you are, would you just grab what you have to represent the body of Christ, whether it's cracker or bread, whatever it is. Would you just hold it in your hand and pray this along with me? God, we thank you. God, we thank you for the body of Jesus broken for us. God, we thank you for your sacrificial love on the cross that we could come into right relationship with you so we could experience your grace and your peace and your mercy. God, we remember that in this moment and we thank you for it and we accept it all over again. In Jesus' name, amen. So you just break it as I did and then take this along with me. Then would you take the cup and pray along with me as well. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus poured out for us. God, we thank you for your grace poured out for us, for your love poured out for us. God, we thank you for all that you did so that we could walk in the fullness of life, so we could walk in freedom, so we could walk in your grace and your truth. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. And then would you drink along with me, church? Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your peace that floods into our life now. We pray that, what, I pray, Lord God, that whatever people are facing, that you would put their minds at peace, you put their hearts at peace, you put their spirits at peace, that you would daily remind us of your grace, that we would daily accept it, we would daily walk in it. And God, I thank you. I praise you for all you've done for us. May this brief moment be just a profound reminder of the price that was paid, of the love that you have for us, and of the new life that we are called to walk in each and every day. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, well, that is church for the day. So glad you joined with us. We love uh, being together virtually. Can't wait to be together again in person someday soon. Uh, For now, be blessed. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you soon, church.